So thank you so much, Peter, for this, I would say, too kind introduction. Uh, perhaps you expect not too much from the lecture, and I hope uh, I can nevertheless um, fulfill your expectations and uh, hopefully tell you an interesting story about, uh, about Germany, because that's why it came to the lecture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we changed the masks. Um, so, the title of the presentation is The Past and the Present. I will more talk about the past and the present, and I hope that in the Q&A we will have the specific opportunity to address the aspects of today's Germany which you are most interested in. Of course, today's Germany is a complicated question, so my primary task at the lecture is actually to show you how we got to today, what kind of components from history made it into today's Germany, in, and the German economic model today. And again, in the end, I will basically open up with some remarks on Germany as it is today, but mostly to a historical presentation, because as you heard, um, I do mostly history, and I do also a little bit of politics, so I can tell you a lot about Germany today as a citizen and as a layman politician, but not really, not qualified to comment on uh, on the country today, I'm a political scientist or something like that, but I hope it will work out. So my agenda is, I would like to start in the 19th century, because uh, as I hope to convince you, many of the things back then matter well until today. Then we move into the 1920s and into the 1930s and 40s, which, as you already heard in the introduction, are the decades which are of greatest interest to me currently, or over the past 15 years, so I, I can hope I hope to show you how what is widely perceived as the German uh, economic miracle after the war, uh, even though I will talk about two miracles, is uh, important but can only be understood as I see it, if you know the context and um, how one got there. And as I said, in the end, I would like to talk about Germany today. Also, since it was mentioned so kindly uh, about the East-West divide, about the tiny place Zika, where I live, which indeed is a very nice way, I think, to understand the past 30 years in German history. Let's get to history, like the old history. Now, this picture is, so my slides mostly consist of pictures, right? I don't have text since, um, especially after the pandemic, I think we're all very tired of Zoom and all kinds of other presentations. So I'll just highlight with those pictures some aspects which are important to me, I hope also to you. This picture here is, of course, not about economics. Uh, you probably know the picture by Kaspar Teller Friedrich. By that, I want you to say that so many other things matter to economics than just economics, right? With the picture, I want to highlight German Romanticism, which might strike you as a little bit of an unusual beginning of an economics lecture, but I firmly believe that um, today's political system in Germany and today's attitude in Germany both to the economy and to technology can be only understood if one has a vague idea of Romanticism. So the early 19th century, after Kant was dead and while Hegel was still alive, was a time when Germans were struggling to understand what this 19th century would mean. And in a simple way I understand it, Romanticism basically means that nature is good, whereas commerce and technology is potentially bad. Right, so um, those two things which actually matter to me a lot today, meaning economics, what I teach, and the technology which enables us to have this lecture, are for the past 200 years something which, until today, when I talk to my students, is something viewed with skepticism. That might surprise you because we think of Germans as, well, you know, big companies, technologically advanced companies. And nevertheless, I think there is a tension which I hope to show you until the very end goes all through those 200 years of, of an economic model which has these roots in a skepticism both towards commerce and technology. Um, German liberalism is also a term which perhaps sounds strange to you because, of course, we think of German history uh, from the 1930s backwards and 
somehow think there cannot be such a thing as German liberalism. But it was not just German liberalism in the sense of Kant or the many, many Kantian schools in the 19th century. There was also German economics in the 19th century, which um, is worth mentioning. All of you know, or probably most of you, in this context, given that it's the 50th lecture on topics like that, might know Karl Menger. But you cannot understand Karl Menger and the Austrian school without understanding the German context of the time. Uh, two weeks ago, I was at a conference in Las Vegas, and we were talking about Menger, and my American friends were somewhat surprised to learn that actually Menger was not at all seen from the German context, the revolutionary. Instead, what he was doing was basically to synthesize um, what other German economists like Wilhelm Rosha had been doing for at least 50, 60 years at the time. So Austrian, the Austrian school, which so many, of, so many of us are interested in, actually came out uh, of that liberal German economics, as I would say. So subjectivism, which is so important also in the book by Peter Petke, is actually something much older than the Austrians. The notion that the value of this glass is only determined, or primarily determined, by the valuation of the subject, of the individual human being, is something which predates Menger by about 60, 60 years, or yeah, roughly speaking, six, six decades. So I have some provocations, some slight provocations in the presentation, and that might be one, which is that even though we are here in the old Austrian Empire, the Austrian economists, well until the 1930s actually, saw themselves very much in the context of the, of the German discourses. Um, and that should be at least sometimes taken into account. Of course, we have this big debate in history, and I don't want to talk long about that, whether it's ideas or reality uh, which determine uh, how things develop. I'm personally somebody who studies history and economic thought. I'm not very well educated in economic history. But I think it's a tension which cannot be resolved. Of course, ideas shape reality, and um, reality shapes ideas, or the way we think. But mostly the presentation will be about ideas and how they reflect it into reality. Mm -hmm. This picture I took from the website of Siemens. Um, it is uh, something from the 1860s. And so I would like to focus on Germany at the time which was, in many senses, I mean, um, quite a specific country. A country which industrialized much later than England. And actually, one can say, now that we are in Moravia, uh, also actually later than Bohemia and parts of Moravia. So it actually came pretty late. And some, country, some parts of the country came really, really late. Marx did not play a big role in Germany until very late. Um, but Marxism, of course, later became important. And I put this part here on the slide because it helps me to, to understand something which is actually the core of the next slide, which is that this country, which of course is you know, of course, formed politically only very late, was not just a latecomer in industrialization and in its political consolidation, but also in the very strange dynamics of that country and of the economic order within that country. So you had a very strong social democracy, much stronger, by the way, uh, than in Austria at the time. Uh, a Marxist party, which uh, only very, much, much later um, disconnected from Marx. You had those German economists, this is Gustav Schmoller, you mentioned Schmoller's Jakob, Peter, in the introduction, who were basically struggling with Bismarck, against Bismarck, depending on the concrete measures, what to do with this society. And I mentioned that not just to bore you or to overwhelm you with historical content, but because it's so much, it reminds me personally so much of the times today. You have a system which is extremely dynamic. So you have a new country. You have a new political system which has to establish itself, and which is very shaky. You have an economic order which is extremely dynamic. You have a legal order which is even more dynamic. So this is my central picture for the whole of the lecture. This here is modern society as it emerged in different countries at different points of the 19th century. 
in Germany, as I said, very late. So before, we had the pre-modern community, right? In Germany, that would be the Gemeinschaft. And the Scottish Enlightenment, but also those German economists in the 19th century, found out that next to the small communities, which we still have, we have the big society. And the big society um, differs from the community because those bubbles here, the economic order, which is the main topic of today's presentation, but also those other orders, the religion of science and the state of, of law, um, start living their own life, meet the specialists, like the economists, lawyers, to study them, but also are interdependent. Which means that if the economy run, if the economy runs well, it can send out positive impulses and it can help a state like uh, the German Empire in the late 19th century to consolidate. But later in the presentation, you will see that it can, of course, also send out disastrous signals and can destroy the order of the state. So this modern society consisting of differentiated but interdependent orders is actually something which came up in the late 19th century in Germany as an idea of modern society and which will be the main line throughout the whole presentation. So we cannot isolate economic thought, I very much like how we welcomed here friends in economic thought. We cannot limit economic thought to just thinking about economic order, but we have to think economic, the economic order in the context of all of this. Because it can set up impulses, or the other orders can send impulses to the economic order, so the interdependence of those boxes or systems, if you want to call them, or spheres, as Max Weber called them, um, is extremely important. This was the world after 1914, which was a world in which Germany was one of the fastest growing economies in the world. Um, by the way, it was one of the most free trading countries in the world, the United States at the time were way more protectionist than Germany. Um, Germany was also, that's quite important to understand, also the Bismarck um, point which I had, was, so after 1871, it was on the, on the, on the imperial level, on, after Reichsgebenen, it was the country in the world with probably the most liberal suffrage. So every man could vote um, independent of the wealth, independent of education, and all those things. So social democracy, as this revolutionary party which wanted to basically overthrow the bourgeois order, very quickly became not just an important party, but a major, and at some point also the largest party in the Reichstag. And those economists whom I showed you, and the politicians, uh, this might be one example, were struggling. How do we deal with that dynamics? How do we help this society struggle with all those orders and their constant evolutions and changes without the system exploding. And they succeeded, right? So um, the Social Democrats became at some point a party which contributed to this uh, society as opposed to trying to bust it in a revolutionary way. But 1914 happened. Um, and of course, I think this picture tells the whole story in just one graph, or in three graphs actually. You have here migrants, you have um, exports, and you have investment flows. And you see what happened, and in the past 10, 15 years, I think we are unfortunately reminded of the threat that we can go there. So basically, this so-called first wave of globalization, which was extremely important for Germany, but also, of course, for most other countries, Germany being one of the greatest profiteers, imploded. The French economist, Frédéric Bastien, was hoping in the 19th century that when countries integrate, when they trade, when they exchange investments and uh, even people, that they won't make war on each other. Unfortunately, as uh, we also know today, integration is a necessary condition which perhaps lowers the likelihood of conflict, but it's not a sufficient condition to have a guarantee for peace. And yeah, so people, unfortunately, our predecessors 100 years ago just destroyed this first wave of globalization, which was, to the normal worker in Germany, 
actually the greatest privilege and the greatest generator of growth you can imagine. So if you think of the worker which Marx describes in the first volume of the Capital, he described that person, compared that person to the worker in 1914, uh, they have nothing in common. They have completely different wages, real wages, they have completely different access to all kinds of societal um, societal welfare. So and many of that, not all of it, but a lot of it was connected, was related to Germany being so interconnected with the global economy, and then the global economy was destroyed. And by the way, this strive for alternative, which until today we have in our discussions, and today we connect that to China or currently to Russia, was of course very painfully felt at the time because all of a sudden a country like Germany, which was, which was extremely dependent on, for example, importing food because it had specialized in industry and was importing from, from other countries, was cut off by the British and um, you would feel how painful dependence is. One of the major points in my presentation until the last slide will be that Dependence, mutual dependence on each other is nevertheless the destiny of our world in those 200 years. So a country like Germany, but I think it applies to Slovakia in a very same way, uh, and to my home country, Bulgaria, um, is just destined to be dependent. So the idea that we can get some form of autarky of independence from other countries is tempting, is attractive, is popular and can be explored by populists, but it just doesn't work. Because if Germany back then, or Germany today, tried to produce everything it needs, it would be a very poor country. So specialization made the country rich, but of course also vulnerable to um, a point of time as a war when you need resources from elsewhere and you don't have them. Specifically, in Germany, two terrible things happened. In, 19, in the early 1920s, in the late 1920s, this is the stock exchange of Berlin. So Frankfurt back then was not the major stock exchange, it was Berlin. So of course you had a hyperinflation in the 1920s, which was, which was disastrous for the middle class um, of people who had invested in war debt, in war obligations of the German Empire, and who lost a lot. Basically, the middle class lost its savings, and until today, as you will also read in and English um, journal, uh, well, uh, magazines and newspapers. There is indeed some trauma about inflation in Germany, which dates back to that time. And then this wonderful stock exchange was, of course, hit, like uh, all other countries, by the Great Depression. But Germany was hit in a worse uh, way than many other countries, just because of the interwar um, implosion explosion, depending on how you want to call it, of all this. The country was so dependent on American capital that when the American stock exchange and the capital market imploded, it had disastrous, um, disastrous, even more disastrous impact um, on the real economy that it had, uh, let's say in France or in Britain. Coming back to my central picture, what basically happened, and this killed the Weimar Republic, were two impulses, disastrous impulses, coming from the economic order. Money was destroyed, so people lost their savings. And then the depression uh, finally also destroyed the confidence that you can have a job in this economy. And so two fatal arrows were sent out by the economic order, and then the order of the state imploded or exploded. But nonetheless, important how we call it. And then, of course, society is over and the Weimar Republic was over. So, economics sometimes is regarded in Germany as a science which is not as important as physics or as engineering, but at that time it was important. And unfortunately, one can say that the old German economists were um, not so much the topic of the presentation failed. They failed to handle the depression and they failed to uh, handle before the hyperinflation. There was new hope, and this is now the sort of optimistic turn in my presentation, which were young, or at least younger 
Interestingly enough, those were not only Germans or Austrians, but also Americans. I have here Frank Knight and Henry Simons, who at the very same time in the 1930s were setting up something in Chicago, which today is called the Older Chicago School. And if you read Simons and Knight on the one hand, and those Germans and Austrians on the other, about whom I'll be talking in a second, there is a great parallel development. They did not write to each other too much. They didn't interact too much. But all of them had this question on their mind, which was, OK, we have a democratic state, fully democratic states after World War I. Those fully democratic states like to intervene. And many of those interventions are bad. OK, that's a simple story for liberals. But the question is, is there a good interventionism? Is there an interventionism, a system of interventions, which is actually necessary so that the implosion of 1933 does not repeat itself? In other words, what are the interventions of the state action, broadly speaking? which are necessary so that this bourgeois society, the big box which I had, does not um, implode again. And this was the quest, the intellectual quest and task, which those people put on the agenda for themselves, but also for later generations. Um, and I want to emphasize on the next slide what they actually did. So what they did was actually a, uh, basically a turnaround in two, in two ways. So the first twist was that until the, the mid-1930s, one can say, they were hoping that, as we, as we would say today, technical economics, um, meaning business cycle theory, capital theory, would save Western civilization meaning that they were hoping that by analyzing business cycles, they would stop the Great Depression from destroying bourgeois society. Somewhere in the mid-1930s, they realized that this did not work out. So technical economics did not prevent Europe from becoming fascist or national socialist. So they switched the central concept of what they were doing, away from equilibrium or disequilibrium, meaning the market in a narrow sense, the economic order as I had it. And they moved actually to the big picture which I had, which was we need to analyze the economy in the context of those other societal orders, because only then we can understand those impulses, which actually, if they get wrong, destroy the whole system. That was turn number one. The second turn is that until that point, they were doing what most academics do, which is positive economics, which is you just describe the world out there and the different economic systems. In that moment, in the late 1930s, and that, by the way, applies to John Maynard Keynes and also to, so to other really socialist economists, they became openly normative, which means that they didn't just study all the economic systems which exist, but they actually took openly the position that a certain economic system or economic order is the one which has to be defended by the economist. So they left the ivory tower of academia and actually went to the agora, so to the marketplace of ideas or to the public discourse and said, well, you know, each and every one of us has a slightly different idea about what a good economic order is, but I want to talk to the citizen by writing popular books like The Road to Serpent, in Hayek's case, or Karl Popper would write about the open society and its enemies. So I, the economist or the social scientist, turns to the citizen on the marketplace and says, look, let me explain you with good arguments why I, your fellow citizen, prefer a specific order which should not be destroyed and of course, in the 1930s, all those orders were about to be destroyed. So in those two ways, and perhaps the second one is more important here, they really changed fundamentally their analysis of economy and society. 
Let me get more specific when it comes to the Germans, because that's, of course, the task of uh, today's lecture. So, in that very deep and dark hour in the 1930s, uh, you got a number of the people whom you saw on the picture before, who said, we need to, so in that time of disintegration of orders or of implosion, explosion of orders, we need to think about the order of the economy. So what can we do so that the economy does not destroy society as it did in the 1920s and 30s? How can we come up with a political economy which behaves better in a post-war world? So after the war, we need to do something. We need to be intellectually different from the economies of the 20s, um, and we also have to defend uh, this post-war society, um, unlike some of the economists in the 20s. Now, I could talk a long about the school. I would perhaps skip that. A school, is, a school is, of course, not just a collection of people, but uh, it really is a collection of human beings who do all kinds of things. If you're interested in that, we can come to the discussion. The Freiburg School is here on the left hand, uh, on the left hand side, whereas all liberalism, which is that broad family of people, includes the private school, but also some other economies. So, Hopke and Rusto were people who decided in 1933 to leave Germany. Eucken and Böhm, in contrast, decided to stay. Uh, they knew each other well from the 1920s. They kept in touch until that was possible during the war, and they reunited their efforts after the war. Um, but it really is interesting to see, and I hope I can get you interested, to see what they were actually doing. So the picture which I showed you from the 19th century continues being relevant, right? So we now zoom into the economic order and say, what is it that actually makes, um, how can you think of the economic order in a slightly different way than it was perhaps before? And what they actually say is this. We have a very dynamic economic process. You can also call it a market process, but generally speaking, economic process. So we have private individuals, billions of them in a globalized economy, who play the game. But the game can hurt society. The game can get you a depression. The game can evolve in all kinds of ways, which people do not perceive as economically efficient or is just for that to be prevented. You need a good framework, a framework of rules, which if the rules are smart, prevents the economic process from degenerating, from creating the kinds of trouble it was creating in the 1920s and 30s. And they say, in a normative sense, that this sh the game should be left to the private autonomy of the private individuals, so the game should be played by the private actors, whereas the state gets the prerogative or the task to shape the rules of the game. You can also see it in a slightly different way, talking about the dynamics of the 19th century, which I mentioned. This here is extremely dynamic. Dynamic also in a sense of dynamite, so it can really bring the system to an explosion. In order to prevent that from happening, you need a static framework, a framework which doesn't change too often, a framework where um, the players in the game recognize stable rules, and those stable rules help those people in the game to play the game in a, in a reasonable way. And reasonable means two things. The game should be productive or efficient in an economic sense, which means that it should produce wealth but it's not enough, right? So the game should also um, be humane, right? Not human, but humane. In German, it would be menschenwürdig, which means enabling a life in liberty and justice. So it's not only about having a nice hotel and nice technology, <coughs> but it's also, it should be an order, an economic order and an order of society, where people perceive that order as, as a good order. 
as a border where they have their liberty and justice and live a good life. And so if we talk perhaps in the discussion about Ukraine and what the Ukrainian people today are fighting for, it's quite obvious, I think, that they fight for such an order. And one thing, of course, is that they want to become a rich country. But coming from a sort of similar country like Bulgaria, I think it's equally important, um, and I guess strongly, that they also want to get an order, their economy and society, which is not just rich, but also free and fair, um, which, both of which, the plenty and the freedom and justice should be guaranteed by the rules of the game. So the task for the Congress in these conversations with society is constantly to think of such rules that enable the game to be what I said it should be, which is a constant search. There is no dogma which tells you these and these and these are the rules. There are some principles that help, but um, we have to constantly rethink the rules. Today we have globalization, that's not new. The world has been globalized, as I said, for 200 years, perhaps for 2,000 years, depending on how you find globaliz define globalization. But we get, on top of globalization, digitalization. Now that we haven't quite understood, so we need a new discussion about the good rules of the game in a global and digital world. So it's a constant search. But I will show you now what the search looked like in the post-war decades, and then together we can also think about the search today. Now, before the war broke out, there was a one there was one final attempt by those liberal economists to nevertheless think about what the world would look like after the war, which was obviously coming. I mean, Czechoslovakia. So this was in August 1938. So in those very tragic moments of war. Or Czechoslovakia. And so they were sitting in Paris, they meaning liberal economists, mostly from Europe, with this American uh, journalist, Walter Littmann. And what they were thinking about is actually what I find the most important task for liberal economists in general, which is to say, what does liberalism mean today? Meaning, in the context of their time, which quite obviously was one of the darkest times you can think of as a liberal. <laughs> Which, by the way, gives me the opportunity to briefly discuss this curious concept of neoliberalism, which, as you <coughs> probably know, is very contested and very problematic, some, some would say, um, concept. Now, in the 1930s, and specifically at this conference in Paris, the World Liberal Colloquium, they had some ideas what this new liberalism should mean, and it basically was captured by the slide that I had before, which is we need to focus on searching good rules of the game. So in the 19th century, many popular economists would emphasize laissez-faire, meaning unlimited liberty. Well, those people at the club one would say it's laissez-faire within rules. So we need the freedom for the economic process for the yellow box. But the yellow box functions properly only when it is embedded in good rules. So, so this was their neoliberalism. I think we can understand neoliberalism, that's at least my understanding of the term in a more general sense, which is that if you take the history of liberalism, in Western terms perhaps since John Locke, and divide it into generations. You have at least n minus one neoliberalism, which means that in each generation you can say that the main thinker for you personally in this generation is a neoliberal compared to everybody else before in the history of liberalism. So for example, Adam <coughs> Smith was a neoliberal compared to Locke. John Stuart Mill was a neoliberal compared to Smith and Locke. The German economists, such as you, people like Fosha, were neoliberals compared to Smith and Locke, etc., etc. So, for today, and for the question about what neoliberalism might mean in the 21st century, um, I think um, we can again say, well, 
It's a very specific time in which we live. And there might be a solid core of liberal principles which are valid over time. But the, the forms in which uh, a liberal order functions in different times is different. And I just mentioned digitalization a couple of minutes ago was one of the challenges. But of course, we have new ideational changes. Uh, we have the European Union. We have the West, which has to rediscover it itself. I'll talk about that later on. Um, Peter kindly mentioned in the introduction uh, Valorant Society, of which I'm a member. Uh, it started very small. Montalajan is just a village next to uh, next to Bebe in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. And they met there, roughly speaking, the same range of economists, uh, like in 1938. They met and basically asked themselves the same question. Does a liberal order have a future in that post-war world? And 1947 looks more optimistic than 1938, for sure. But it was not so super optimistic, right? So Germany was still divided <coughs> into zones. The Allies didn't really know, the Western Allies at least, what to do with their zones. There was hunger. The Marshall Plan was only announced uh, months later. So it was actually quite a depressed uh, moment. And yet, if you study what they discussed, there is a sense of optimism, right? So there is a sense that, well, after all, at least Nazism is dead. Communism is still there. But um, at least one of the two major devils of the 20th century is now defeated. So perhaps at least in the West, liberalism has a future. But it won't be easy. There is, so those are transcripts, uh, or those are photos from the, from the archive. So you can see this paper of Wojtkin and the paper, for example, by, um, by Hayek and by, um, by a representative of this old Chicago school, which I spoke. And they, roughly speaking, go in the very same direction and the direction I already, I already gave you, which is less fair within good rules, and we have to think what good rules mean. There is a very recent book, it came out, sorry it's so small, um, it came out two months ago. It's an edited volume by Bruce Caldwell, and it's in the Assessment Veteran, 1947. So it's a book of that size, and he, so Bruce Caldwell edits the, the minutes and uh, transcripts of that conference. And you could very clearly get a sense with what they were struggling and how they they were optimistic, but also cautious about the future of liberalism in the Western world after the war. I recommend the book. It's fairly cheap and very well edited. So if you want to get the spirit of the conference, uh, it's perfectly capturable there. And uh, by the way, for the Kolob-Lippmann, you can get this book um, in a Springer database at any university for free, or buy a um, paperback for $20. So both um, books are highly recommendable if you're interested at those discourses. Now let's zoom back into Germany. Germany was, in a paradoxical sense, lucky after uh, the war to have the men on the picture. Ludwig Erhardt was not a great economist. I think all Erhardt scholars would agree with me. He was somebody who had actually studied business administration, so something very practical. But uh, for ideas, you also need practical men, right? So, I mean, it's not enough to have smart people like Hayek or Eucken who generate ideas. You need people who can communicate <coughs> those ideas. Erhardt was also luckily discovered by the Americans as somebody who would administer first Bavaria and then the Western zones. Economically, and then in 1948, which is before the founding of the Federal Republic, he partially coordinated with the, with the American allies, partially not so coordinated, to would do two things. One thing was clear, and that was certainly coordinated with the Americans, which is you need new a new currency, right? So the old Reichsmark was completely valueless because the Nazis. The frozen crisis in 1936, 
to prevent inflation, and then they had printed money to, uh, to fund the war machine. So there was way too much money, and uh, it was worth nothing. But a new currency would not do, would not suffice, if um, the prices are still frozen. All of those economists who you saw believe in the dynamics of the economic process, but the beauty of the self-coordination in the economic process. If prices are frozen, as the Nazis have frozen them in 1936, a new currency will not change too much because the prices cannot show the new scarcities of this completely destroyed uh, economy. And we don't quite know to what extent he discussed that with the Americans. There is this legendary scene with General Clay in Frankfurt, uh, where the Americans were coordinating uh, the United Western Zones. And so Clay would say, well, actually my advisors told me that you should not liberalize prices. And I had said, well, so did my advisors, but I did it nevertheless. Well, this can be a legend. We don't quite know whether that happens. Oral history is always a bit <clears throat> tricky and uh, not quite precise. The point is, he did it. And he just didn't just do it in 1948, but in the next 20 years, he would try to convince West German society that this was the right thing. So he was a political entrepreneur in the sense that he understood that actually society hates him for that because people got very little from the new currency. If you had savings, those savings were gone. So basically everybody started very equal and very poor. Um, and every, everything was extremely expensive in the beginning. So West German society started extremely poor on top of that, it's even more important. It was a profoundly anti-capitalist society. Remember the Romanticism? So Romanticism plus um, the common accusation that National Socialism, even though it's called National Socialism, was a product of capitalism. So basically, the common idea that the Nazis were a product of capitalism had made West German society extremely anti-capitalist. So the question was, how do you call that new economic model or order or system so that this anti-capitalist society can live with it? Remember, people and should accept the rules of the game and see them as free and fair. But people, when people hate something, they wouldn't see it as free or liberating as and, and fair. And here um, comes in the famous, perhaps infamous, concept of the social market economy, of which I will, call, I will talk now. So we're now coming to, roughly speaking, the post-war decades, and what happened in West Germany. I'll briefly speak about East Germany afterwards, but let's have a look at, um, at the Federal Republic in the 19, well, basically in the 40 years of its existence, from 49 to 89. So usually, when you when you discuss West Germany in a textbook <coughs> or also among economists, people would say, "Well, the economic miracle." To begin with, for those economists, when you saw in Paris, nineteen thirty-eight, or at Montpellier, nineteen forty-seven, this was not a miracle. It was just very simple, good economics applied to to an economy which needed a restart. So basically. You got prices liberalized, you got a new currency, then in the 1950s you got antitrust law, so you would dismantle the huge concentration of the Nazi um, economy, and you would get the Bundesbank also in the 1950s, so somebody who takes care of the currency in a, in a good way. So there was not, nothing too miraculous about the economic miracle, and also one can of course look at France and Italy at the time and uh, they were growing just as much, right? So growth was there um, in the Western world, basically on a, on a universal scale. So I don't, and personally, I don't find this macroeconomic performance to be the most important. Of course, it's fascinating to see a completely destroyed economy uh, resurrect, but um, this is not, in my view at least, the real miracle. The real miracle is this one here, 
which is that if you think of West German society in 1948, when Ludwig Erhard did those reforms, it was in two ways at least one of the most terrible societies you can imagine, apart from the defeat and apart from the moral um, catastrophe of the time. In terms of ideas, that society was probably one of the most divided societies you can imagine. You had millions of Nazis, millions of socialists, communists, some liberals, lots of conservatives, and all of them hate each other because all of them impute on each other that they were guilty for the war. So an extremely polarized, divided society in terms of ideas. If you look at the economy of the time, it was probably one of the most unequal societies. Because on one hand, you would have somebody in West Germany who still has a house. And his neighbor doesn't have a house because a bomb fell on the house, but he would still have the piece of land where the house is built. But then you would get 16 million refugees from the former Eastern territories, which only have a horse. Right? So ideationally and materially, it was an extremely antagonistic, polarized, divided society. And the social market economy, which is, again, not only about the economy, about the economy in the context of society, was conceived by a person who called the term, I didn't put him on the pictures because there were too many pictures of all men anyway. I thought Murat Hartmann said, the social market economy should be a so-called ironic formula, which means a formula which enables society to find peace and harmony with itself. Now, if you think of this society, which hates capitalism, has extremely polarized ideas, and is materially extremely unequal, it is not quite easy and <coughs> predictable that this society will find peace with, it, with itself quickly or actually in any speed, right? But it did. So if you look at the political parties and groups in German society, you will see that already in the 1950s, the unions, the churches, in 1959, the Social Democrats, all start subscribing to the rhetoric, the rhetorical formula of the social market economy. What the social market economy mean can mean many different things depending on who defines it. I know that this was a conversation in the afternoon that today also social democratic parties have uh, perfectly, are perfectly at ease with using the term. By the way, it's a little bit like neoliberalism. I think we are free to define what a social market economy means today. It's certainly something different from what it meant in the 1950s. But it certainly means that it is a, it is a market economy with um, with some preconditions which make it acceptable to people. The market economy is something, I think many people in the room will agree, something very absolutely fascinating, something which makes us rich, which makes us, um, which has all kinds of wonderful effects. Many people who have given this lecture before have written whole libraries about that. The question is, however, how do we make people accept the market economy? And social does not really doesn't necessarily mean that we need to give people money. Um, in my understanding today, and we can discuss that in the end, it actually means that you help people accept the market economy as something which consists of people, obviously the market economy consists of billions of people, but it is a market economy which somehow is in line with our ethical um, ideas, and by that we accept that, um, that gain of the economic process which you saw. But again, I put a question mark there on purpose because I think, um, and actually the people who coined the term said that each generation should, should give the term a different meaning, and certainly in Slovakia or Bulgaria we can also do that even more free than the Germans did, or the Germans do until today. So until today it's a very important term. So if you ask people in Germany what is the German economic model, they will tell the social market um, of course, it's, it's a term which is indeed accepted from the very far left to the very far right, 
Uh, we can say it's meaningless by that, possibly. But I, in the very polarized and divided times in which we live, similar to the 19th century with which I started, perhaps such rhetorical brackets or connections uh, which are shared by so many people have some value even though those different groups understand the term in different ways. It's of course in the treaties of the European Union, so we find the term uh, in the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, when Pinochet uh, implemented his uh, economic reforms uh, in the 1970s and 80s, he called it social market economy, so economia social de mercado. Lukashenko, in his early years in Belarus, also called uh, Belarus uh, social networks and economica. So by that you see that, of course, it cannot be something meaningful in the sense that all those people include the same meaning into it, but it seems to be a sexy rhetorical formula. And in the West German case, it performed those two miracles, right? So society became rich, but society found peace within itself and it found peace with capitalism, which, given the complicated historical heritage of the country, I find pretty fascinating. So if that is the merit and the, um, the yeah, basically the performance, uh, the achievement of the social market economy, it's not little. If you think of a country like Russia today, which uh, has perhaps similar, you know, perhaps has actually similar historical burdens and uh, problems, but we should also think in a time after Putin perhaps how this society finds its way to the West and to the market and such rhetorical tools um, could help. Now, I was supposed to speak for about an hour. Um, now I'm speaking for 52 minutes, um, so it's perfectly well-timed. I have one more slide which will enable me to talk about Germany today. And then I would like to open the floor and to see what you are interested in historically, of course, when it comes to the Germany today. So, as I said, the social market economy as a term and concept is still very much alive. In the newspapers and in the public debate, you have constant discussion what it means. When I came to Germany 22 years ago, it was seen as something old. But then the country went through the financial crisis and through the, through the next crisis in a somewhat successful manner. So you can see basically that whenever the economy is doing well, the social market economy is seen as something well, old and also necessary. But in times of crisis, and our world, well beyond Germany, of course, is full of crises, the attractivity, but also the, uh, the popularity of the term goes up because people say, okay, we need to have something in common, we need some common economic identity, and it is a social market economy. And in some ways it also helps, right? It helped after 1990 about the East, as we will see in a minute, uh, but certainly until today, for example, when the corona, in the early phase of the corona pandemic, some measures which are which go back into the 1950s, for example, that you don't kick out people of the factories, but you have some buffers, and you employ people at shorter times, and the state compensates. Uh, those buffers actually helped to um, not be hit by the initial corona crisis, as hard as, for example, the US was at the time. It is an extremely global, globalized economy, as open as very few other countries. Switzerland would be one example of an even more open of course, in the 1990s, I'll speak about East Germany in a second, but of course, the great achievement of the 90s and 2000s was the openness of the German economy to the East. So, countries like Slovakia, Poland, so at some point later, also my country, Bulgaria, became extremely integrated with, with Germany. To give you one example, everybody now is discussing, of course, the importance of Russia and uh, how Western countries can or should isolate themselves from Russia. In the German case, if you look at German exports to Russia, on the one hand, 
and then the German exports to Bulgaria and Romania. Not hugely important countries, right? I, mean, I have a Bulgarian passport, but my country is not important. They are roughly speaking the same. So Germany, Germany exports to Russia as much as it exports to Bulgaria and Romania and imports. So by that you see the extreme level of integration with countries like Bulgaria and Romania who are even further away than Slovakia. So that's what happened in the 1990s and 2000s. Of course, as I spoke about 1914, globalization comes with dependence, and dependence is what we have to live with if we want to have uh, our globalized planet uh, and to have all the benefits of it. So, of course, the German economy is dependent on that openness to continue. And given the tensions with Russia, which I said, as I said, it's not an important country economically, but of course with China, uh, that openness is now a super hot issue. My last slide is this. I teach in Zwickau, I've lived in Zwickau for 10 years before I lived for 10 years in Hamburg. Um, and ever since I came to Zwickau, I, um, I have to say, and I think it's appropriate in this audience, that I feel all the time that it's, so East Germany, where I live now, is between West Germany and Bulgaria. In some ways, it reminds me of West Germany, and in some other ways, it reminds me of uh, Bulgaria, and I will tell you about both. So as Peter mentioned in the introduction, it's a really funny place because until 1946, cars like Korch, Audi, and uh, what belonged to that conglomerate with the four rings, uh, which was something which was built in the early 1930s as a, as a holding basically of four brands, was produced in Zika. I live very close to the factory. And 200 meters behind that factory, you would have this factory, right? So it's a place in southern Saxony between Leipzig and the Czech border. Obviously, a very traditionally industrial place. Um, and it's funny to see capitalism and socialism in their economic systems at that same place and to compare what happened. So whenever I have to teach my students about socialism and why the planned economy failed. I just tell them, okay, we go to the factories and talk. And we go to the factories and visit. There is a wonderful, so this is a picture from the Audi Museum in Zwickau. So you get from the very first Audis to the very last Kavant, and you have everything there. And I tell my students, okay, um, the car itself, probably many of you remember it, I mean, even I remember it as a kid, was not stupid, right? So the East German economy didn't have too much metal because it was disconnected from the western part uh, where you had all the metal production in the in Zadland or in, in the rural area, so they need something else. And my university, which was already involved in the producing in the production of Audis, came up with the idea that the car should be produced out of well basically cardboard. Um, so the idea was not stupid. And I always tell also people when I lecture on I was writing a book at some point about the central plan economy of the GDR. It was not the people who were stupid. People were probably even more inventive and more creative than people in the West because they had to fight all the time with scarcity on a level which Western engineers didn't know. But the story of the Trabant actually captures the failure of, so of socialism and of the central plan economy in a super elegant way. Because if you look at the first Trabant, 1957, and at this last Trabant, so this is the three millionth Trabant, but then even the East Germans stopped buying the car. Today it's a bit cold and uh, funny and attractive, but uh, well, they don't differ. So the car of 1957 and the car of 1990 is, <coughs> apart from some minor, minor, minor details, actually the same. And I always tell my students, look, we, we, we have a look at this one, and then we see how an Audi car developed between 1957 and 19, um, 19, 19, 
And of course, the Audi car of 1957 has nothing to do with an Audi of 1990. Whereas the Trabant of 1957 and the Trabant of 1990 is the same. So, what is the failure of socialism? In one sentence, and the central planner of East Germany, who by chance was also born in Tsiko and was running the central plan economy of the GDR from 1962 until the very end, in his memoirs basically says, we, the central planners, were getting from the factories, from those engineers and workers, smart ideas all the time. But we, the central planners, all the time, would not allow those inventions, those engineering ideas, to become innovations, meaning new products. Why? For a very simple reason, the Austrian economists in the 1920s would say that you cannot plan a dynamic system. So if all the engineers get their ideas into the plan, the plan becomes chaotic. You cannot plan something which actually has to be rescheduled at any moment. So whenever Zwickau says, we want more aluminum and less copper, in that same moment, you would actually need to reframe the whole plan of the GDR for aluminum and copper, and probably for many other materials at the same time. So that central planner would say, yes, there were brilliant ideas to produce much better cars, but we, the central planners, suppressed those ideas, so they never became products. Right, so it was not a failure of normal people, it was not a failure of the engineers, it was a failure of that system which actually systematically suppressed innovation. And that's why it died, right? Um, economically at least. So um, I find that story particularly captivating. Now why do I have the third car here? Because by chance, in 1988, there was a crazy idea to supply the Trabant with Golf engines, and so Tsiko got in 1990 a new Volkswagen factory, which was not so important until a couple of years ago. I mean, it's a very big factory, and also the region has heavily re-industrialized because of this factory. It's not just a factory with many, many suppliers um, who um, are supplying something for Volkswagen. But currently, and I think this is, this is also the success, one success story which tells you a little bit about the reunification process, about which my last sentences will be. Currently, it's the only factory in the whole Volkswagen conglomerate which produces electric cars. So whenever you see an electric car on the street by Volkswagen, ID3 or ID4, it's made in Zwickau. So in a strange sense, you see also, I think, in that picture how history matters, in that case, economic history. The reunification is a very hot, emotional, and to a certain extent, mythical debate. Whenever I talk to my students, I hear all the myths and legends which their teachers and parents have told them. So the GDR saw itself as the 10th largest economy in the world. If you read the memoirs of the central planner, Gerhard Schuler, you would read that all of it was actually complete rubbish by 1990 because it was technologically extremely uh, old and obsolete. So the privatization went, like in all our countries, very quickly and very, um, well, it created lots and lots of tensions. But the important point is really that the West Germans did one big mistake, a mistake I think which Ludwig Erhard would not have made, which was to impose the whole bureaucratic system of West Germany, which was already difficult in the 1980s for the West German economy and its productivity. And this whole system was imposed one to one and immediately in 1990 on the East German economy. Apart from the exchange rate question, so was the new, so the Deutsche Mark too expensive in East Germany, which it certainly was, I think the bureaucratic burden which was imposed on this very weak and old economy killed the few factories, there were not many, but the few who could have survived, I think, were crushed by this bureaucratic burden, which, um, as I said, already in the 1980s was producing unemployment in West Germany. So there were smart people who would say, let's try to make East Germany a sort of a, a, lab, a, lab, a laboratory for experiments, or let's try to reform 
our West German model by trying out different regulatory regimes in East Germany, but it didn't happen. So it is um, until today. Um, oh, oh, today, the, this, will, this will be my end. Today, if you look at the numbers, and in that sense, it reminds me of West Germany, as I said, it reminds me of Bulgaria, but it reminds me of West Germany. So it reminds me of West Germany in one specific sense, which is that uh, actually, in terms of macroeconomic numbers, it was successful. East Germany today, in nominal income, is about 70% of the West. In real income, meaning price adjusted, it's about 80% of the West. And if you take the West, and if you take out Bavaria and Van württemberg which are industrial powerhouses, actually East Germany is at the absolute average of the remaining West. Right? So in that sense, I think you can say that it is quite a successful transformation. Now, whether people like it, whether people appreciate it, is another story. Um, it reminds me of Bulgaria in some post-socialist patterns of thought, so foreigners, people like myself, are not really very welcome. Um, and um, pluralist society, meaning people with very different orientations and with very different ideas about a good life, are somehow seen skeptically. So you still feel socialism in the air, even though my students are all born in 2000. 2005 or something like that. So it's a complicated legacy. I think it could have been done in a smarter way, the reunification. The, main, the bottom line, I think, is positive. I mean, economically, it has been pretty successful. There is no certain re emigration of East Germans who live in the former Western part and are moving back to Leipzig or to Dresden, to the major places. Uh, many, the main question and problem is how Berlin as a state and as a city develops and whether it can become a dynamic, um, a dynamic hub which um, helps to push further the uh, development of East Germany. But there are some very, these, these are my last sentences, there are some very recent investments which are pretty promising in Magdeburg, which is more than nice city to live, now got a huge, huge, huge investment by, by Intel uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, Tesla opened a couple of weeks ago this huge factory next to Berlin. So all this is happening in East Germany, not in the West. By that I think one can see some signs of optimism and some reasons, I think, to be optimistic about the eastern part of the country. If of course, the current war in Ukraine and all the challenges which we see in our world, independent of Germany, get resolved, but this probably will be part of the Q&A. So thank you so much, and I really hope that we can have, now have a good discussion with each other. Thank you.